Amen. If you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 12, a passage I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, We call them the Beatitudes. And so the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. If you have your Bibles open there now, uh, do me a favor, please, and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Matthew writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to us. Beginning in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven." For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray together. Oh God, today I pray that you would help us to have the eyes of faith to see what true happiness, true blessedness, true joy is. And God, I pray our hearts will be changed by the power of your word this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Perhaps it's a chicken for every pot and two cars for every garage. Maybe it's providing better for our kids than what we had growing up. Maybe it's pursuing a better education for ourselves or for our children or our grandchildren. Maybe it's transforming your financial picture. Maybe it's a whole lot more or a whole lot less than any of these things, but all of us in one way or another have a conception, we have something in our mind that helps us understand what it means when we think about the American dream. It means to succeed in the world we live in. The American dream, essentially, as you probably know, is the way we think about living out life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. Simply put, even our very country is an experiment in trying to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And simply put, all of us really want to be happy. In fact, our, our society is, if anything, preoccupied with the notion of all of us being happy, doing what it takes to be happy. And, and we have built around this idea of being happy, all sorts of language, all sorts of therapy, all sorts of different things to help us pursue being happy. As I've already said, we live in a place that's literally meant to help us be free and pursue happiness as we please. Frankly, it is a good thing to want to be happy. We don't want to want to be sad. However, as I read these, this passage to you, these 12 verses, and couched in the middle of these 12 verses are these beatitudes, these statements on blessedness, this short God to happiness. Could anything feel less like happiness than what Jesus is describing in these verses? 
It just doesn't sound happy to us. In fact, the title of the sermon, first of all, I made one mistake. It should have been a normal length sermon on a short guide to happiness. And it's pretty clear to me already that several people have been confused by this. I've never seen a group of people so happy to be at church and so disappointed when they asked me if that meant it was going to be a short sermon today. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, all that being said, uh, let me say this. I mean, the, the title itself, right, is meant to help evoke a sense of irony for each of us here. It just doesn't feel happy. It doesn't feel like a happy passage. It doesn't seem like a guide to happiness. And yet what Jesus is doing is describing true happiness. You know, the word happy is hard to use in this sort of context because so often what we think um, happiness is is so enculturated for us. It's so couched in, the, in our understanding from our culture that it just means to be temporarily happy at any given moment. And so the other thing that's become a challenge really is that the word blessed is hard uh, really to use these days as well. It, it, it takes any sort of personal uh, activity out of it. It feels like it simply means just we receive blessings, hashtag blessed sort of thing. Uh, our instincts are all out of whack. They're all out of sorts when it comes to thinking about what it means to pursue true happiness, when we think about what it means to think about what it means to be blessed by God. We're all out of sorts. We're all out of whack. But here we see Jesus beginning his ministry, and we see Matthew giving us one out of five times he'll do this, a discourse that's meant to help us get a sense of what it was that Jesus taught. Now, the Bible says he went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom just a few verses before this begins. So we already know that as Jesus begins to teach here, as he, as the Bible says, opens his mouth to teach them, we know that this is part of what it meant for Jesus to teach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. He begins by saying, blessed are those. This is clearly a hearkening back to the first psalm. Blessed is the man, that psalm begins. I want you to know something. As Jesus is opening his mouth to teach them, and he, as he begins with a treatise on true happiness... I want you to know that these beatitudes, these teachings on blessedness, what they're meant to do, I, I believe, is to reorient our thinking. If we're already out of sorts and out of wax, Jesus is trying to straighten us back out. He's trying to get our thoughts lined up with God's thoughts. That's precisely what faith means. It, it just simply means seeing things the way God sees things. We are so focused on what we can see, what we can touch, what we can taste, what we can smell, what we can, what we can see with our eyes, what we can experience in the flesh. But the Bible is constantly calling us to put on a different set of lenses and to view the world with a different set of lenses. And those lenses are the eyes of faith, and they're meant to help us see the world as God sees it. The, the Beatitudes are here to do just that. Most of our thoughts on happiness are based on what we can see, what we can experience right now. But the Beatitudes are meant to help us see true happiness through the eyes of faith. So this morning, from the teachings of our Lord, I want to show you three truths about true happiness. The three truths I believe are going to help each of us, myself included, understand what true blessedness means from God's perspective. To see blessedness, to see true happiness through the eyes of faith, Therefore, from God's perspective and not from man's perspective. It's going to help recalibrate and reorient our understanding of what it means to be truly happy. Here's point number one. True happiness transcends circumstances. True happiness transcends circumstances. Look what the scripture says. The Bible says, He saw the crowds. He went up, verse 1, on the mountain... And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So 
the, the, the large crowds. This is the most popular Jesus will be, essentially. He's in the popular session section of his ministry. And he sees all these crowds, and so he's in the hill country. And so he goes to a section of uh, the hill country. Some people think Matthew is trying to sort of associate Jesus with, with Moses here by saying he goes up on the mountain to reveal uh, these teachings to them. I, I think that's probably a fair assessment in many ways. And so Jesus is here nonetheless, we know, especially by verse 2, he opened his mouth and taught them. This is a way over time in the Old Testament that things will be phrased to show that God or a prophet was speaking with authority. And so if Matthew is meaning here to evoke to us the idea of Moses on Sinai bringing the word of God, here we have Jesus himself speaking according to his own authority and telling these people what it means to be blessed. Notice, though, that this is specifically for those who are following them, him. This is for his disciples. And so here we can see these are not, this is not teaching that's going simply to all the crowds, but particularly those who are singled out among them, who are following Jesus. And so they come forth, and Jesus begins to teach them. And in these first four Beatitudes, I think Jesus shows the way that true happiness, blessedness, transcends circumstances. You may be like me. My circumstances tend to dominate how I think. Whatever it is I'm going through tends to dominate how I think. In fact, if you think about it, if you're misunderstood or if something happens, sometimes I'll be short with someone or maybe a little snappier uh, than I should be or, or something like that. And almost always when we do that, what do we say? It's just I'm having a bad day, right? If you had known what happened to me this morning or if you knew what was on my mind, you would understand why I'm acting this way. And listen, that's a really good reason. We are people. We are human beings. We live in the world. Things happen. God cares. If he's got every hair on your head numbered, right, he cares about what happens in your day. So don't get me wrong. But Jesus here is showing that our circumstances don't define our blessedness. They don't dictate to us whether or not we can be truly happy. Notice the first thing Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In an analogous passage in Luke, Luke doesn't say in spirit. Luke just says blessed are the poor. And so it's clear here that Jesus in both contexts, I think probably this is reflective of similar teaching or things Jesus said in different contexts, um, it's clear that though he says here poor in spirit and in other places poor, in both contexts, he doesn't want us to think about less than actual physical poverty, but he certainly wants us to think about more than just actual poverty, not having enough. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One little note of housekeeping here. You'll notice that twice the reward, the, the, the result of the blessedness that Jesus talks about is the kingdom of heaven. It's in the first beatitude here in verse 2 and in the last beatitude in verse 10 showing that all of this, I think, this is what authors and scholars call an inclusio. It's where we open with a theme and close with a theme. They're sort of like bookends around what Jesus is saying. So we're, we're meant then, I think, to understand all of these beatitudes, to, to find their fullest realization in what Jesus is teaching and preaching about the kingdom of heaven. He's preaching the good news of the kingdom. And here we see him framing the way he talks about blessedness with the blessings of the kingdom. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who are in need of help. I hate, I mean, I hate needing help. Do you guys hate needing help? I hate to need help. And even more than I hate needing help, I hate admitting that I need help. I think I'd rather need help than have to admit I need help, you know? I don't like it. I, I, I don't like to say that I'm not enough. I don't like to say that I'm insufficient. And, and part of 
the reason, I think, why the Bible so often talks about those who lack the physical needs in this world in a positive light. So often, I think, it's because so often those who don't have the world's goods, those who are poor, are forced to trust the Lord in a way that maybe others aren't, in, in unique ways. And that's not to say it's always a, it's morally better to be poor. There's, that's nowhere near what the Scripture teaches. And yet, Matthew's extending this out to our souls. Not all of us can relate. Not, not everyone, that, some of us in the room can relate. We know what it means to do without. We know what it means to be poor. Others of us have no clue what that would feel like to be poor. But all of us here know what it means to need God's help spiritually. All of us know what it means to be poor in spirit. And I don't like admitting that any more than I like admitting anything else. That I need God's help. That's difficult to do. It's a shot against our pride. But does it seem like anyone who needs help would have any sort of kingdom? No, that's not how kingdoms work, is it? We take them by force. We take them by right. We earn them. And yet, it's not so with the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who are sad, for they shall be comforted. Think about this, friends. Think about how upside down what Jesus is saying is. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now listen, this is about as countercultural as it gets, isn't it? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. No, blessed are the bold. Fortune favors the bold, right? It, b- blessed are those who bulldoze others. Blessed are those who stand up no matter what. Blessed are those who go out and say what needs to be said, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are gentle. Blessed are those who are kind. Oh, it's so silly. We, we live in such a silly age that we think meekness is the same thing as weakness. I think it's one of the silly, it's so silly on its face. Is it not the easiest thing you do to fly off the handle? To stand up for, I mean, there is nothing more instinctually easy for me than to bow up on somebody. You know, I've got just enough sand mountain in me. Um, you know, that I'm just like constantly like kind of at a low simmer. You know what I mean? I've got some, some Irish and Scottish blood. I'm from, the, from Sam. I, mean, I just got a little bit of a low simmer, you know? There's nothing easier to me than I'm like, finally, an excuse to get rowdy, you know? And there is nothing more difficult in the world than to be meek. There is nothing more challenging in the world than to turn the other cheek. And to believe that that means you will inherit the earth, it takes faith. When you are mourning, to believe that one day you'll be comforted. There's nothing, there is nothing that feels like comfort when you're mourning. It's just not. You're sad and you're mourning and, and, and you have to believe one day you'll be comforted because right now you're just not. Doesn't matter what people say, doesn't matter what people do, you're just struggling when you mourn. God says one day He will wipe away every tear from every eye. And the Bible says those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This word righteousness, it doesn't just mean longing to be without sin in our own hearts, even though it does mean that. Longing to personally be righteous. Do you ever have those days where you think, man, I I just... I I am struggling to fight sin today, and I'm so weary of fighting sin. I'm so tired of learning another thing that I've done wrong. But the Bible also, when it talks about righteousness, it also talks about the longing for justice that we have in the world as it is. Man, you, you, you can't look at the world as a Christian or as anyone who cares about justice whatsoever without feeling deep in your bones. Oh, God, would you make this world right? You hunger for it. You thirst for it. And do you see what the Bible says? Those who hunger and thirst 
for righteousness, both justice in the world and a personal righteousness in their hearts. If that's what you hunger for, if that's what you thirst for, you will be satisfied. But as you, if you look at the world right now, it's like, man, the only people that are going to be satisfied are those who long for injustice and those who long for sin. Doesn't it feel like that? It takes faith to see the world as it is. And, and, and when you think about the circumstances we encounter every day, it gives us every opportunity to absolutely think that all of this is simply a, a wink and a nod, hoping against hope for something that will never happen. We'll never be satisfied. We'll never inherit the earth if we're meek. Our circumstances are going to define who we are forever and ever and ever. We'll always be mourning. We'll always be mistreated. We'll always need help. We'll always wish for something that's more. But what Jesus is saying is that you can actually find true happiness in all of these things because it transcends your circumstances and that He is providing. God is providing through Jesus hope in all of these situations. Not only for the future, but even in any given moment. True happiness, blessedness, transcends our circumstances. Second of all, true happiness comes from a transformed heart. Jesus shifts after these first four Beatitudes. He shifts from sort of things that are happening outside us to some things that are going on inside us start to get a little less comfortable as the sermon progresses here. It's like, uh, I think if Larry Furman had been one of these disciples, he would have said to Jesus what he often says to me. Today, preacher, I think you went from preaching and got to meddling. <laughs> True happiness comes from a transformed heart. You see what Jesus says next in verse 7? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Oh, it takes faith to be comforted when you mourn, doesn't it? But how much more faith does it take to be merciful when you've been wronged? How much more faith does it take to believe that God will settle all accounts? Oh, it's so hard to believe. Because right now, friends, I, again, I, I, I always... Deep in my heart, I want my pound of flesh. I want to see full justice served immediately in this life. I, I am allergic to mercy in the flesh. And yet the Bible says so clearly that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And so mercy is something that can only come from a transformed heart. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We are merciful because God was first merciful to us. It's the biblical logic. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How can we have a pure heart unless God, through Jesus, transforms it? Oh, do any of us long for God apart from His help? Do all any of us have a pure love and devotion to the Lord without the power of the Holy Spirit? Of course we don't. Again, we need a transformed heart. Are any of us going to be peacemakers? 
actively try to make peace. That's, that's different than simply being at peace or accepting peace when it comes. That is, we are called to go out and try to make peace. And the Bible says, for they shall be sons of God. In other words, this is a, a way that Jesus is showing his disciples, I have come to make peace peace. And if you want to experience the fatherhood of God along me, alongside me, you need to have a transformed heart that allows you also to be a peacemaker. All of these things are things that only God can do for us. Now, very friends, if we want to be truly blessed, if we want to be truly happy, if we, if we want to have a shot at experiencing a relationship with God, we must have our hearts transformed. That can only happen by God's grace through faith in Jesus. We won't be able to see the world with the eyes of faith unless we first trust in Christ and have a heart that's been transformed. Here's the last thing I want you to see. Not only does true happiness transcend our circumstances, not only does it come from a transformed heart, but finally, true happiness depends on our standing with God. It depends on our standing with God. Notice what the Bible says in verses 10, 11, and 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus goes on and gives us a little commentary on this last beatitude. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Is there anything much harder? I mean, it is so difficult to be poorly thought of. I mean, it, this is one of the last things our society still believes is a sin, is to be judged. It, it's difficult to feel judged. It's, it's difficult to feel poorly thought of. It, it's even more difficult. I, I don't think there's anything harder than this. It is so difficult, so challenging to be persecuted or reviled or to be lied about. If you've ever been lied about, I've, I've been lied about. I've experienced that in my life. Um, cruelly, frankly. I, I don't mean that to ask for pity. I just want you to know I, I've been there. <laughs> I know it's hard. Um, and, and everything in you wants to set the record right immediately. Just, again, I, like I said, I got enough Sand Mountain in me. You know, let's just sort this out. Everything in your flesh wants to do that. And yet, somehow... Jesus calls this blessed. Blessed. Jesus says we're blessed. We can find true happiness when this happens to us. Now notice this caveat, for righteousness sake or for his sake. When this happens on his account. I think some of us want to go offend people and call it persecution. Huh. You know, if you're not doing things Jesus' way, you're just kind of out being a jerk and being ugly to people. That's not persecution. That's consequences, okay? So then all of us need to remember. But when we are pursuing Jesus and loving Jesus and we're lied about because of that, and I think increasingly a lot of us who are Christians in this culture feel that a little more and a little more every day. And, and I, again, I want to tease out that don't just think, you know, I want to make sure, okay, for Jesus' sake, How can we consider that a blessing? Jesus gives two reasons why. One, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. And number two, because your reward will be great in heaven. For so they treated the prophets before you. How in the world? Can you do what the apostles later did in the book of Acts? And when they were persecuted for preaching, consider it an honor, the Bible says, to be treated in this way for the sake of Jesus. How in the world can we look at something like reviling or lies or persecution and look at that and say, I am happy in Jesus because of this. It takes the eyes of faith 
to see the world in such a way that everyone in this world is so wrong about who you are, about what you believe, about who you follow. They're so wrong. Everything you see makes you feel like you're wrong. Everything you experience makes you feel like you're wrong. But faith says, my reward is great in heaven. Faith says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to me. All the kingdoms of this world may conspire against our Lord and our Christ and may conspire against those who follow Him. And yet, even if that were to be the case, the kingdom of heaven would still belong to you. Oh, what a thing to believe. Friends, Matthew is showing us here the way that Jesus taught the good news of the kingdom of heaven. And as we read these things, we can see how Jesus, even as he begins to open his mouth. So sometimes people act like Jesus just had this moral teaching and then all of a sudden he shows up and he dies on the cross at the end of the book. It's kind of weird, you know? What are we supposed to focus on exactly? Friends, do you not see how even here, as Jesus is teaching, He is pointing His disciples to the cross? He is preparing them for what He is doing. He's beginning to shape their thoughts and the eyes of their faith to see the cross for what it is. Don't you see the way that Jesus is pointing to His own life? Jesus Himself is the blessed man par excellence. He is the fulfillment of Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, for that matter, the Son of who will rule the nations. Jesus experienced all of these things. Jesus mourned. Jesus was lied about. Jesus was reviled. Jesus was persecuted, even to the point of dying on the cross. And yet, He was nonetheless still blessed of God. In fact, the Bible says it was for the joy set before Him that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and that now He is seated at the right hand of God. Can you see that it's only through the gospel? Only, I I would never expect you to believe any of this if God Himself hadn't stepped into this wicked, upside-down world and through the cross turned it right side up. Our hope is not nebulous. It's not out there just hoping something will happen one day. God Himself came here, died on the cross to make it happen, and then He raised from the dead as a guarantee that we will share in His blessings. If Jesus is in heaven, if Jesus has brought the kingdom of the world, so will you be if your faith is in Him. He'll never let you down. He'll never disappoint you. Friends, it's only through the gospel. It's only through seeing the world by faith that you can find true happiness. It's never, it's always going to have to transcend our circumstances if we want to find true joy. It's always going to come from a transformed heart if we want to see true joy. And brothers and sisters, true happiness will always depend on our standing with God. And today, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus, you can have perfect standing with God no matter what man may say if you'll turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus I want to invite you to do just that this morning if you've never trusted Jesus if you've never put your faith in him today you can I believe if you turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus you will be saved second of all you may say uh, pastor I'm a Christian but I need to be reminded of what true happiness is. I've been chasing the world's happiness and I, I want to see God's true happiness, God's blessedness through the eyes of faith. If you need someone to talk to, you know where I'll be. I'll be right down front. If you want to do business symbolically at the altar, you can, but respond to the Lord right where you are if that's where you feel most comfortable. And finally, maybe looking for a church home. What a joy it would be for me today to talk to you about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.